folks have joined since the morning when we did introductions for new folks, if we could start doing that. Um, I don't know, just name and where you're coming from, anything else you want to tell us. Yeah. Okay. Hello, I am Latif McLeod. I am a doctoral student in the Anthropology and Social Change Program at California Institute for Integral Studies. Like Adam Soria, I was not here yesterday to introduce myself. I am going to give a brief presentation on disability justice and the connection with social ecology. So before we jump directly into the panel content, um, just run through a little more in introduction of the panelists ourselves. So this panel will be about politics of disability or disability justice, a couple of different frameworks of looking at that and, and the intersections and tensions with social ecology. Uh, so Latif, I'll, I, since we all have a couple of us have written bios, we'll start there maybe. So Latif is a writer and scholar who's working on a PhD in the Anthropology and Social Change Program at the California Institute for Integral Studies. His first book of poetry, A Declaration of a Body of Love, 2010, chronicles life as a black man with a disability and tackling various topics on family, <clears throat> dating, religion, spirituality, his national heritage, and sexuality. He currently is writing a novel titled The Third Eye is Crying, and also another poetry book entitled Whispers of Crip Love, Shouts of Crip Revolution. His writings are available at latifhmcleod.com and on the Huffington Post uh, slash latif Um Hi, Edmund. Can you speak Should I now or when I? I think now is good. Yeah. Um, I'm Haida still, um, <laughs> uh, but just more fully, I came to the ISC, as I said, in, when I was 21, in 1984. Um, I was in Drawl. Murray in those days used to encourage people to move to Burlington to be part of the study um, groups and to join the Burlington Greens, and I did that in 85. And I hung out in B. Bookchin's house. So B and Murray were my mentors um, for many years. Um, and I really think I got my, my BA and my PhD in that house in Burlington. Um, um, I taught at the ISC for 22 consecutive summers, um, not one off. Um, while we had a our program, I taught feminism and ecology, and then when Murray was unable to teach anymore, Dan and I co-taught the anthropology, politics, and philosophy of social ecology. And I've been teaching um, on the online class and, and at, and at intensives, and I became an anthropologist in the 90s, and um, my special focus is sort of gender studies, queer studies, and global free politics. And I was in a bunch of move movements. I was in the Burlington Greens, Black Greens. I was a radical lesbian separatist, um, eco feminist movement. To do it all. Great. Uh, I'm Kelly Roach. I use she or they pronouns. I'm a organizer and co founder of the Symbiosis Project that you've been hearing about, um, helping to bottom line uh, organizing our Congress. Uh, which is happening next month in Detroit. Uh, also part of uh, the ISC board um, and uh, part of Libertarian Socialist Caucus within DSA. Uh, by day, I write and research around energy uh, and exposing corporate utilities and their activities uh, on both the economic and ecological fronts. Uh, so I think we will each share some thoughts and remarks that we've prepared and then we can have a, a discussion. Um, Want to make sure that we leave lots of time for that as well. So Latif will okay. speak first. This talk will focus on the commonalities that social ecology and disability justice and their potential visions for liberation. For this presentation, I will rely on a paper that I wrote for my PhD program of this entitled The Promise of Social Ecology and Disability Justice in Making a New Society, and I will also pull from writings and readings that I did since then. 
Hopefully this presentation will illustrate how the social ecology movement can align with the disability justice movement to advocate for a more just, egalitarian, and ecologically sustainable world. In my paper, I focus on three main components in the comparison between social ecology and disability justice, which are in the capitalist critique, a focus on mutual aid or interdependence, and a focus on an ecology of sustainability for our society. I argue that a social ecology philosophy will work well with the disability justice framework because of their shared values and goals. For a little background on the disability justice framework, it was started by disability activists of color, mainly in the Bay Area in the early 2000s, who saw that the disability rights movement up to that point was mainly led by white middle class disabled people and didn't address some of their concerns regarding race, sexuality, and economics. The framework of disability justice came out of these disability activists wanting a disability movement that was much more intersectional in its scope addressing race, class, sexuality, and environmental issues. The disability justice framework includes 10 main principles that advocate for a more equitable and sustainable society for disabled people. The 10 principles are as follows intersectionality, leadership of the most impacted, and a capitalistic politic, cross-movement solidarity, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, interdependence, collective access, and collective liberation. This disability justice framework meshes well with social ecology that is anti-hierarchical, focus on mutual aid, and an ecological sustainable society. For the aspects of social ecology that I focus on in my paper, I mainly highlighted that the effects of capitalism is devastating the ecological balance of the planet, referencing Brian Tokar's article in the Institute for Amateur Studies entitled Movements for Climate Action towards utopia or apocalypse. <clears throat> I also quoted Murray Bookchin in his article, What is Social Ecology? in the book Social Ecology and Communalism, where I reference his argument on how our ecological and social ecological challenges need to be solved together for a more just and sustainable world. Bookchin argues that instead of focusing on competition in the capitalist system, Human societies should be based on the principle of mutual aid, which is the human value of supporting and relying on each other as a community. For the remainder of my paper, I detail how social ecology and disability justice intersect in their shared values. I state that the social ecological value of mutual aid is very similar to the disability justice principle of interdependence. This eighth principle recognizes that we all need each other to survive. This is especially so for people with disabilities, where interdependence has been an important tactic that allows many of us to engage in our communities. People with disabilities recognize that true freedom does not come with isolation, attempting to be completely self-reliant and independent, but rather freedom comes with one who can freely associate with people that are mutually invested in each other's survival. In the Disability Justice Primer put out by the Disability Art Collective, Simpson Valley of it also states that we see the liberation of all living systems and the land is integral to the liberation of our communities. As we all share one planet, burn 2016, 18. Entangled in the disability justice value of interdependence is that we all are a part of the living ecosystems of the planet and must do our part to protect that balance. The other disability justice principle that intersects with social ecology is the principle of sustainability. Disability justice states that people, especially those with disabilities, 
need to live in societies where they have the freedom to pace themselves as their lives are conducted and not feel pressured to perform at a capitalist level of production. Individuals with disabilities need to be able to rest while at work and have the option to stop work altogether to sustain their health if that is what is required. For too long, capitalist production and profit was exalted over everything else and now we realize that constant production is not only damaging our ecosystem, but our bodies as well. That sums up the synopsis of my paper. I will now expound about how crucial it is for social ecology to incorporate a disability justice critique in its philosophy, and how disability justice can also incorporate social ecology into its framework. First, social ecologists need to realize that with the anticipated climate crisis, vulnerable communities will be affected the most, which includes the disability community. If climate devastation causes social collapse, it will be the disability community that will be the most vulnerable and need the most mutual aid. As a result for the social ecology community to be in solidarity with the disability community, they will need to consider disability justice principles in any transition from capitalism. Also, social ecologists and other parts of the left need to include disability community more in their organizational strategies. This may change some things in your organizational strategies. One change can be paying more attention to access needs people may need in your group. This goes with the ninth disability justice principle of collective access. An access need could be needing a place to be wheelchair accessible so you can maneuver around in your wheelchair, having a set free area for those that are sick to fragrance, and having a sign language interpreter for those who are deaf and hard of hearing. It could also be as simple as waiting for someone with a complex communication need to compose something to say on this speech generative device. As a result, meeting people's access needs assists you to be more inclusive to a wider community that includes disabled people. Social ecology also need to account for the pervasive oblige marginalization that disabled people experience in the dominant society. Ableism is experienced by disabled people because they cannot match the expectations and the lifestyle of the able-bodied norm. One could argue that ableism has a long history in human societies. However, with the rise of capitalism, societies found a new reason to marginalize disabled people in light of seeing them as less productive than the rest of the population. Because of this, disabled people were mass institutionalized and barred from American life in the 19th and early 20th century. American cities passed a series of laws called ugly laws that made it illegal for disabled people to be seen in public. This history influenced our culture so that disability issues are almost always made invisible and neglected and even left politics. Issues with disability are usually construed as being individualized medical issues and not recognized for their overall political importance. Also, until the 60s and 70s, people with significant disabilities were often secluded in institutions and were not in the public sphere so that they could be organized by the left. As a result, social ecologists have a real opportunity to organize with activists with disabilities around common goals. There are a segment of the disabled population who have their impairments caused by the continued industry and destruction of our lived environment, so that is a connection social ecology has the opportunity to strengthen organizing within the disability community, especially the disability justice community. We have the shared goal of advocating for an egalitarian, ecology-sustainable, and accessible society. <clears throat> I also want to highlight that an effect of dominant society's pervasive ableism is that people with disabilities 
especially people with significant disabilities, are more isolated in their communities because of their bodily, cognitive, or psychological difference. This isolation, in addition to being an emotional and psychological strain, also causes disabled people to be vulnerable to abuse from family members, caregivers, and fascists that are a growing problem in our communities. As we know with fascists, they set their sights on the most vulnerable as their first victims of violence and persecution. It is up to the social ecology community and other communities on the left to stand in solidarity with the disability community so they will not be immediate victims in this current rise of fascism in this country. This concludes the end of my talk. Now I will pass it on to my left to child. I'm not an expert in um, disability studies at all. I'm kind of stepping outside my my historic, usual area of expertise, which was sort of feminist theory, social ecology, science and technology studies. But I've been living um, sort of disability studies, or been living sort of just the narrative of what it means to live with a disability for 20, 30 years. And I, in the last five years, I've been doing a lot of talks um, more locally at colleges and universities um, speaking about autoimmunity. And that's what I'm going to kind of, kind of focus on today. Um, and then I'm going to try to bring some of the broader sort of implications out. So briefly, my story, which is crazy long, um, it actually starts with my grandfather, who um, immigrated to the U.S. from Russia or uh, Belarus. And when he, he got here, he was 12. When he was 24, he began to become really ill with um, MS. And muscle sclerosis is a is autoimmune disorder that leads one not just chronically ill, you feel sick, um, but you are also disabled. So in that case, in his case, disability and, and illness overlap. I want to make it clear that not all people with disability are ill. It's a really important, important thing to say. That often I know folks who are disabled who have enjoyed pretty good health and energy levels. And I, you know, kind of joke with disabled friends of mine. I'm like, wow, you're kind of doing a little better than I am in a lot of ways. Um, so my grandfather got MS, and they were very poor. Um, they lived in a tenement. They could not afford a wheelchair. Um, they were kind of hungry poor. And my mother grew up terrified that this would be passed along. Because in those days, they really didn't understand what MS was. Um, and uh, I was told you know, from very early age, don't tell anybody that your grandfather has MS, because nobody will want to marry you. Um, and I used to literally think about, okay, what's the age, the common age of contracting MS? It's usually just like in your mid to late 20s. And when I was 28, I had this big birthday party. Score, I don't have MS. Um, when I was 31, I got a really bad, just flu. It seemed like it's a flu. And I didn't ever really recover from it. And what happened was I developed this sort of ongoing fever and feeling of having the flu all the time. And um, lack, just a, a kind of crushing exhaustion that was not relieved by sleep. Had to go to bed really, really early. And my life just started at 31 to get a little smaller um, with each passing year. But between the ages of 31 and really 52, 53, and 57 now, I was really able to function. I, um, I believed my running as a runner was keeping me going. I kept thinking, this is, this is what's separating me from other people I forgot to mention. I got diagnosed when I was 31 with chronic fatigue syndrome, um, which I did never have. That was my diagnosis. And I, that's, I identified with, a chronic, with CFS and the community. That was my identity. Um, I was very closeted about it, which was kind of <coughs> that was a very out loud um, lesbian separatist, lesbian feminist, but I was very closeted about being ill. Um, I told people in my IC community, but it was I did not I was not out publicly because in those days and still to this to this day, saying you had chronic fatigue syndrome was like saying I'm fucking crazy, um, I'm lazy, or I don't want to admit that I have depression or anxiety or something. So I really was not very out about having chronic fatigue syndrome, which I never really had. 
Um, in, my late, in my early 50s, I started to go off a cliff. Um, there were a number of things that happened that make, it's, that, that make, that make sense. Um, and personally, I had nothing in me really to fight to go find specialists because I was convinced I had chronic fatigue syndrome and there was no treatment for it. And my male partner, um, you know, I, I think he, uh, um, um, Stephen Colbert did a really interesting bit the other day about disability and brought Wanda Sykes in about healthcare and the way racism and sexism affects people's access to good health care, and Wanda Sykes comes out, and she basically just says, Wanda Sykes is a black lesbian comedian, and she comes out and says, look, if you want to go get good health care, bring a white guy. And she just said it, right? <laughs> and I just laughed, because I was saying, while Stephen Colbert was talking about this, um, I was like, that's why I bring you, Alan. Like, I go to every medical appointment with my, with my white man um, partner, and it makes all of a fucking difference, and it should not, but it freaking does. Um, and I can say because my, before I brought a man with me and, and after my, my experience really changed. So my partner contacted the Massachusetts Seafoods Association and, um, when I was around 52. They said, go to this doctor in Boston who was one of the few people looking, taking um, CFS patients. My doctor wouldn't prescribe me, would not refer me to go see the specialist. She was my BCP of 22 years. And when I asked her why, she said, because Chaya, she never learned how to say my same name, because Chaya, um, you're not really sick, you have depression. Hmm. And I said, do does, <laughs> all the doctors that I've been seeing, but you sent me to rheumatologists, they think the same thing, just, oh yeah, we all we discussed your case, you have depression. And, um, and I am a lot of things. I'm a highly neurotic. <laughs> um, but I'm actually, I'm, I've been blessed that I actually don't suffer from depression really in my life. And I actually have a master's in psych, and I, you know, have been going to therapists since I was 14 years old because I had a traumatic childhood. But I'm actually not depressed, and I knew that this was not depression. I saw my life before my big infection, 31, my life afterwards. Um, anyway, she retired a month later, and I, I went to my new PCP, and I said, you know what? My doctor forgot to write this referral letter. And so I gave it to her. And I got to go to see the specialist in Boston. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my life changed. And that was five years ago. Um, she sent me to a pulmonologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a neurologist. And I was diagnosed within literally three days um, of kind of invasive and weird testing. If it's too weird to go and ask, but later I'll tell you about weird tests. But basically, I was diagnosed with um, a autoimmune disease of the autonomic nervous system. That you have two nervous systems, the central is your, your brain and your brain stem and your spine and all the big nerves that go out. And science is about 20 or 30 years um, ahead in understanding the central nervous system. And there's very little known about disease of the peripheral nervous system. So if you are somebody sitting here like me with a disease of the peripheral nervous system, you're kind of screwed because there's really not much known about it. So what I have is actually my grandfather's disease. It's MS, but for small nerves. So MS attacks this, the long myelinated nerve fibers that run your central nervous system. And um, what I have is called autoimmune small nerve fiber polyneuropathy. It attacks the small nerve fibers that run your peripheral nervous system. And that's every automatic function in your body. So that's, it's, it's rest, it's digest, it's, it's sweat glands, it's heart rate, it's blood pressure, it's temper, temperature regulation, it's sleep regulation, it's digestion, it's the whole, every autonomic function that you have when you have my disease, um, you end up with what's called dysautonomia, which is dysregulation of the peripheral or autonomic nervous system. Um, I started IVIG, which is um, very hard to get in this country. Um, it's, I get, that people call it liquid gold, I get, um, I take 18 hours, two days in a row, of 18 hours of infusions of 60,000 people's immunoglobin go into making four bottles that I get pumped into me every month. And it costs $120 at my hospital to get that. And, and I'm on Medicare because I'm on disability and that, I'm, that's, that's paid for. And it took, a, took us six months of advocacy for my pulmonologist, who's very famous, and my neurologist in Boston to get me that. And because I've been on IVIG, that's why I'm sitting here today. 
Um, Hi, you said $120 a month. Is that I'm sorry, $120,000 a month. $120,000. And, and, and this is how crazy it is. Had I done it at Brigham and Women's Hospital, that's what they wanted me to do, it was 136 Different hospital, whatever, it's, it's, it's insane. And um, being on IVIG, for me, it took two years to start actually working. It can take anywhere, anywhere between five weeks and two years. At the two-year mark, you kind of know. And at my two-year mark was last February, I went in and I did a nerve biopsy where they compared it to a nerve biopsy pre-treatment. And I'm regenerating nerve, which is like fucking amazing. And, and how it works is that I'm being poured I'm getting, they, they, they put all these different immunoglobins into my body to literally confuse the shit out of my antibodies and to override them and, and literally to neutralize them. So my antibodies can't attack my peripheral nerves and destroy them every day and, and cause all this inflammation that makes me feel like shit. Um, so my, my energy level is higher. I'm able to sit up, I'm able to walk longer. Um, a, I have a condition called POTS and it's part of too much to go into. Um, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, my story. And, um, well, the other pieces of, of it is that I, um, part of understanding the puzzle of my illness of autoimmunity was realizing that I have a genetic disorder that, that, that made me vulnerable to getting this autoimmune disease and to getting many. And I'm telling this not just to tell you or bore you with my story, but because I really want to raise consciousness around Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. If you leave here with anything, I want you to know those words. E H L E R S, Ehlers Danlos, D A N L O S Syndrome. There are millions of Americans and people all over the world who have Ehlers Danlos Syndrome and do not know it. I had no idea I had it until three years ago when I was watching videos of people with um, autoimmune disease of the peripheral nervous system and they're all talking about having Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. And I'm looking at their, their, their skin. And I'm like, shit, this one looks like me. This one looks like my daughter. This one looks like my sister. There's something about their skin, and they were white. And um, people with darker skin, I can tell also, um, it's easier to see EDS skin when somebody has pale skin because often it's almost translucent and looks very creamy. Um, and I can explain what, I, I know now four people of color with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who also have this skin and it has different properties. But I was able to see these white women's skin and, and I'm like, shit, I wonder if I have that. So I went online and I, I, I did the online, so I looked at the Canadian criteria and I diagnosed myself and I called my neurologist. I said, could I possibly have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? He said, oh, of course. Um, and he said, 90% of people who have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome end up happily having their disease. So, why did that matter? It mattered a lot because I needed to know, well, I wish I'd known I had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome when I was younger. It would have explained a lot of this, this bizarre ass weird shit that, that happened during my life. Um, the most important thing was it allowed us to understand our daughter. So my daughter became diagnosed with EDS three years ago. Ehlers-Danlos is a connective tissue disorder, and it, you produce bizarre collagen. It's faulty, bad collagen. Collagen is a glue that glues together your bones, your um, your joints, your your tissues, and your organs. Everything is glued together by collagen. So if you have EDS, you have it's a multi-system disease. You have problems with all over your body, and if you have peripheral um, um, nerve system damage, you have problems all over your body. I just want to say, I always think of this funny moment with Brooke, like 10 years ago, we're sitting at some sort of ISC intensive in New York City, and I'm like tired and besieged by like 50 different medical things that are happening. And she goes, Kaya, I've never met one person who has so many fucking things wrong with you. Will you write them all down? <laughs> and I was laughing, and I was like, okay. And so I start writing down this list. It is longer and longer and longer, and I'm like, holy shit. And like I gave it to her, she's just like, what? And, and it was just, for me, a very big aha moment of like, how is this even possible? And if you understand what a multi-system disease is, it all makes complete sense. Um, so the reason the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, one of the reasons it really mattered is that it allowed us to understand the scale of the problems that our daughter has who's 16. My, my sister now knows she has it, my nephew has it and we can anticipate some problems. My daughter's a three-curve scoliosis that we discovered that really needed to be understood, which is a pain syndrome. 
And then in March, for the last six months, she developed the neurological autoimmune piece of the disease, of the, the disease, autoimmune disease of the peripheral nervous system. And it's going to take, it can take years for her to, be, to qualify for the immunotherapy that I'm getting, which is hard as a parent to be waiting for your kid to get um, treatment. So EDS is important because if you have EDS, you have a 30 to 80% chance of developing um, not necessarily my neuroimmune disease, but autoimmune disease. And anybody with EDS should be going to their doctor and demanding annual panels to check your SED rates and to check your ANA, which is an anti-nuclear antibody test, and to really um, tell your family members to all be checked for autoimmunity. Um, and now just autoimmunity, a lot of people know what it is. Raise your spark if you know what auto disease, autoimmune disease is. Um, I'm going to say basically it's one disease and it has to be understood as one disease the way cancer is one disease. It's not like, oh, you have, you know, Graves disease or you have lupus. Or you, these are all, it's the immune system getting completely over um, activated. And there's three usual reasons that leads to um, autoimmunity and it's the environment, and we're seeing an exponential increase in autoimmune disorders, um, and that is the absolute tie-in to ecology, that the more that our food and our water and our air and our whole world is chemicalized, we are seeing a dramatic increase in autoimmunity because we, we did not evolve to process the kinds of chemicals that we're being bombarded with. So one is environment, um, Two is, is genetics. There is absolutely, at least in my family with the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, a clear link. When I went to the geneticist who died. I didn't really diagnose myself yet. You can't get, you can't get it or diagnose it yourself. I went to a geneticist at Brigham and Women's who specializes in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. He did the whole genealogy. There's your grandfather with the MS. And when we kind of understood things, it was clear he also had the peripheral um, disease as well, because he had the neuropathy that I have. Um, I feet don't numb. I, there's times where I can't feel my hands or my feet or pain, either pain or numbness. And he had that too. But he was not diagnosed with that. Um, but, where was I going with that? So anyway, what? Here's the third. You said there were three. Ah, thank you. Uh, a part of this also is it affects your brain. Um, I, I have four autoimmune disorders and all of them affect your brain. So my, all my concepts are there, but my working memory is not so good and I, I absolutely have what's called brain fog. Like at my last years of teaching, I would have moments, it was very embarrassing. Now I, I kind of don't give a shit anymore. I'm just like, help me ask somebody. But when I first started, it was very humiliating. I would be in the middle of a lecture, a student would ask a question and then I had no freaking idea where I was in the lecture at all. And then I'd be like, um, 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 Somebody help me out. Okay, so the third thing, so environment, um, genetics, and usually there's a trigger, a traumatic trigger, and the trigger can be, it's usually a viral um, infection or a bacterial infection. In my case, it's a viral infection. It's probably a mono-like virus that triggered it. Um, it can also be childbirth. Or it can be a stress of a surgery. It can be a car accident. And I happen to have had a child and a car accident, <laughs> and that absolutely sped up my disease. Had I not had my child in a car accident, would I be where I am now? I have no idea. But my doctor says it's, if you look at the arc of my disease, I got much sicker after I had my daughter and then I had my car accident four years later and um, things got much, much harder. Um, and then there's stress. So if you're living well of color, right? Um, if you're living well queer um, or um, gender non-conforming, if you're poor, you are stressed. And that doesn't mean people who aren't those things are not stressed, but it means those are given to you are fucking stressed. So autoimmunity is higher. People are thinking that autoimmunity is higher among women of color, particularly poor women of color. Um, and I say women because 80 to 90% of people with autoimmune diseases are women. There are, of course, men. My grandfather was a man with, with MS and with small fiber neuropathy. Um, but there's some sort of hormonal 
play, there's some sort of um, protective mechanism within, I guess, testosterone, people are thinking is protective against autoimmunity, but there are many men uh, who have autoimmune disorders. I don't want to erase that experience at all. There are, of course, signal. Okay. there are, of course, trans men um, who were born with female bodies who are susceptible to autoimmune disorders as well. Um, so how does this tie into social ecology? Um, I want to really just echo everything that Latif said so beautifully. Um, but that um, my absence from being here had nothing to do with anybody here. I feel like the ISC has been nothing but accommodating and welcoming and encouraging. Um, but I think other organizations and other things have been part have not been like that. I feel like people here have been like, we'll Skype you in. You know, we'll get you a place to sleep. You know, we'll, we'll make it work for you. And, I, and I'm, I'm always very aware of, of how this organization has been extremely inclusive. Um, but a lot of other political organizations are simply fucking not. I mean, I remember going to Occupy Wall Street and sleeping in a utility closet like, between lectures and kind of coming out and people like bombarding me and having, taking it personally. And I, I didn't know how to explain to people what was going on. I was very sick at that time. Um, going to mass action is a big fucking deal. You know, I decided my last mass action was the third time I ended up in a hospital at a mass action. Um, that you can't really be exposed to the nerve agents and, and the tear gas when you're sick. You know, and certainly if you're in a wheelchair, you're vulnerable as fuck in a wheelchair to mass action. You don't want a cop figuring out how to get you in and out of your chair or, what, or where the hell your body should go. And if you're sick, and my joints are screwed up, I mean, I have been in mass actions when I was younger where, I, you know, my joints are very fragile where I had my arms wrangled behind my back. I partially dislocated shoulders both times. Um, I have a permanently locked jaw from my Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which makes me very vulnerable. If I have any blow to my face, I'm really up shit's creek. Um, there's just this kind of physical vulnerability that people with chronic illness and disability carry around with us, and we try to not show it because it's, you just don't want to show it. You want to be like, I'm a badass, you know? And you can be a badass, but you're also, there's this kind of vulnerability. You don't people feel sorry for you. You know, you want to educate people. It's like this, um, but I feel like there's a way in which we could do a better job as a movement to really make explicit statements of the way we hopefully are trying to do around feminism and racism, around ableism, has to be really forefront and, and explicit statements around how we accommodate, how we anticipate um, issues that people, special needs people might have, special accommodations people might really um, need. Um, I want to end by saying about autoimmunity is that, you know, there are people in this room who either have autoimmune disorders, um, you're living with them, or you're going to get them. <laughs> um, and I just want to say, you have to listen to your body, and that's something I did not do. You know, I listened to my stupid fucking doctor who told me I was depressed for 20 whatever years, and I believed her. I was like, I don't need to go get any specialized, any specialists. I don't need a neurologist, I don't need a pulmonologist, I don't need a target, and now I have five specialists I work with. But um, I didn't listen to myself, and every few years, new things happen, and the, 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 the thing I want to leave you is, New shit shouldn't happen to your body. That's not normal. If you notice that you're tired, way more tired than you were before, like go to your doctor and if they say, oh, you're fine, insist, I want my sed rate, sedimentation rate. I want that taken. Ask your family about autoimmunity in your family and demand. Um, in my case, I turned out to have fucking lupus. I learned I had lupus just in, in March, it was confirmed. I knew it in December. It was confirmed in March. It took me 25 <coughs> years to get a diagnosis for lupus. That is on. That is that is completely criminal. I've had a fever since <laughs> since 1994, living with a fever of 100 plus. And my doctors have been like, I don't know. If it's not over 101, it's not really a fever. And that should have been a red flag waving. And I have Sjogren's syndrome. Which fucks up my eyes really bad. I might lose my sight and 
box up my mouth really bad. It's affecting my speech right now. Hopefully you can't tell. I can tell. Um, but I, sh I knew something was wrong. I could tell was, my eyes were burning in my head for years. And I did not ever go to my eye doctor and say, you know, um, whatever. I didn't listen to my body. I listened to biomedicine. Even though I'm a radical, and even though I don't trust authority, and even though I like to see myself as a badass, and even though I was out in every way, politically, as, as a queer for 20 plus years, I still was very scared of doctors and afraid to be a problem. And, and I really took pride of going into my doctor and being like, you know, I'm good, you know, I've got, I've got my shit together. Um, and finally, you know, I lost my career. I had to stop teaching in my early 50s. And that was, you know, the love of my life. I loved teaching. And had I gotten diagnosed with EDS, and had I gotten diagnosed with my autoimmune disorders, and had I gotten my IVIG even 10 years ago, I know for a fact I would still be teaching. For a fact. And, but, you know, I hope to God that we'll get my daughter immunotherapy so this doesn't happen to her. But, you know, spread awareness, spread consciousness, and goodwill, and let's make our movements just smarter. And, and, and warmer and warmer inclusive. Thanks, Kaya. Um, Kaya and I have a lot of similar experiences, so I, I won't retread that ground. I have the EDS space. That's apparently. crazy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that is crazy. Um, I also have multiple autoimmune diseases um, under evaluation for couple of, uh, of re-diagnoses. I think it's pretty common for people with uh, constellations of illnesses like this to have their diagnoses change or have incorrect diagnoses at many points in their life. Um, and obviously that matters for a lot of reasons, but treatment certainly, materially, um, psychologically as well, certainly having answers to, to some of these issues, I think, um, it's a frighteningly common story with women and, and um, people assigned female birth in particular. As, as Haya has said, I had, a, I had a very serious viral illness when I was a teenager and I, nothing was ever the same after that. And it took 10 years before I wound up in the hospital with a life-threatening infection and found out that um, I had this autoimmune disease that no one had ever, ever checked for. Uh, so I think that is, something that's happening a lot um, and definitely something that there is a, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's complicated for anyone and organizing itself is, is complicated for anyone. And so being a disabled or sick organizer is extremely complicated. And I think there are a lot of um, particular stressors or demands, especially drawing on what we talked about last night around the kind of impending doom and uh, urgency that a lot of young people especially but but many of us share around the the climate and ecological catastrophe that we are facing and the need to throw all in on that but how that can be very complicated when um, physically and and in other ways your capacity is very, very variable or um, really uh, can be hampered by by these illnesses. So just from a practical perspective, that's something I wanted to raise, but um, want to move us shortly to discussion. But ahead of the panel that, <clears throat> excuse me, tomorrow, that will be taking place around animal liberation, which is a discussion I'm really looking forward to and thrilled that is happening in this forum. Um, just want to, before, not without getting out ahead of that, talk a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, I can tell my voice often goes, which is part of this the constellation of symptoms. Um, talk a little bit about the intersections of disability, animal liberation, and social ecology, um, which are three frameworks that personally have been really important to me politically, kind of coalesced for me at a, all, all at the same time. And in my own experience, political development, uh, I think there is a animal, the animal liberation framework is something that can uh, contribute to the the discussion of how to address some of the, the tensions we see between uh, disability frameworks, including disability justice and 
social ecology and, and also um, maybe to, to tease out some of the, the intersections. So uh, a book I definitely recommend is called Beasts of Burden. Sonora Taylor is uh, a disabled writer and uh, an artist who, who wrote this book. She's a, a scholar, uh, unlike me, about disability issues and uh, is, ha has basically addressed uh, a lot of the, the intersections between uh, disability frameworks and, and liberation. Um, uh, to my knowledge, I, I know her a little bit, we're not uh, close colleagues, but uh, has, has not identified kind of as a social ecologist, but the, yeah, the, there you go. But Nesta does too. Uh, but there are, I think, a lot of very uh, social ecological concepts that are part of this argument and treatise. Um, so wanted to, to bring that into the conversation. Um, so as we just, you know, have already talked about, there's both a, a lived experience of disability and you know, an academic or um, analytical framework. Uh, so just, just to, to posit that to begin with and how uh, when using that word, I think there are implications for for both of those, uh, Latif also talked a bit about medicalization kind of as well, and um, it, just to introduce a concept that is often uh, talked about or is really central in a lot of disability organizing and, and disability communities, the idea of a social model of disability, which is that it's not necessarily, dis disability is not necessarily constructed from individual medical issues, but rather uh, issues around built environment and social constructs. So for instance, whether a you know, building is, is wheelchair accessible, you know, the decision we're making to use certain types of stairs versus uh, ramps or other methods of ascending into a space, uh, that's, a, that's a choice. Same thing with things like you know, flashing lights and loud noises that we take for granted as part of you know, police infrastructure, for instance, which you know, are, are Probably deliberately agitational to certain types of people, but uh, that those are that these are they're all ways to create more accessible environments, um, and not to not to even mention you know many of the social dynamics that have already been addressed. Um, but yeah, I think um, the way that that this starts to to come together with social ecology for, for me is around uh, being, having you know, one foot in these circles and also in kind of uh, disability circles that understandably uh, disabled activists and disabled people often reject comparisons to non-human animals or um, uh, you know, other elements of non-human non society which are, when those comparisons are, are made between um, human disabled people and, and non-disabled, uh, or excuse me, non-human animals, those are often with a, you know, an intent, right, to, to be hurtful, to be harmful, um, to infantilize. Uh, so they're, they're, you know, to, to just to recognize that they're not made with charitable intent usually, uh, but, you know, simply reducing those comparisons to something that's bestial or kind of unevolved is, I think, very, uh, also misses a lot of richness in the ability to use as an analytical framework, looking at, um, for, for both within human society, the way that ableism takes shape, um, but it, engaging with the rest of the natural world um, to, to be able to reflect upon that and to move toward a more, uh, liberatory framework. So um, certainly ideas of you know, within social ecology what is what are first and, and second nature uh, and, and the missed opportunity to examine and gain insight into frameworks of hierarchy and domination that, um, that are absent when we reject outright rather than necessarily engage with some of these these comparisons or um, intersections as as um, disabled people. So I think that's that's one point. Um, and you know vice versa that recognizing all bodies, not just human bodies, are subject to ableist oppression 
uh, I, I'm sure tomorrow there will be more discussion around um, kind of industrial and, and factory farming as well, but that most animals in factory facilities are uh, intentionally effectively disabled. Uh, that especially uh, there are implications for this around you know, gender as well, and for instance, hens you know, being forced to lay uh, four or five times what is you know a, a healthy amount of eggs to produce um, for you know capitalist production. Um, so, just uh, you know, I, I think this is a, a really rich area for. The disability community and disability activists to be more engaged with and certainly I think for um, social ecology as, as well to bring an intentional framework and analysis around disability politics to many of the uh, you know, frameworks of hierarchy and, and domination that are already so central to social ecology. Certainly mutual aid is a, a, a key example, positive example as well that Latif has already uh, covered so I won't, won't dwell too much more on that, um, and yeah, I, I just generally um, really compelled by you know the extreme, the the idea of extreme violence that humans you know are exhibiting towards other humans and non-human animals, and, and the uh, disability or framework or or ableist um, elements of that, uh, especially I think now and and Latif spoke about the rise of fascism and vulnerabilities that particularly relate to that for disability communities, but uh, especially, I, I you know, have seen a lot of engagement from the IC and social ecology community around eco-fascism and, and the rise of uh, or popularization, uh, troublingly, of, of that mode of, of analysis, if you call that, or thinking, uh, and, and I think that that is a, 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 just a, you know, within the, the taxonomies of fascism, something that's really important to address for the implications that has for disabled people. Um, certainly a lot of you know, Malthusian arguments that we see through eco-fascist frameworks around, you know, the extermination of, of disabled people or, or um, violence against disabled people. Um, so I think that this is, you know, just a, a call as we are considering Ecofascism and social ecology's response to to that, um, what what that specifically means for commitments to um, disabled peoples in our communities, and and also just more broadly as a, an analytical um, frame of mind. So I will I will stop there. Um, just a kind of constellation of thoughts that is not too organized, but hopefully will generate some discussion and questions. So um, I will take I'll take stack. We'll yeah we're going to start with with. Nesta, I will use progressive stack, but of course, all disabilities are not all visible, so please um, just feel free to indicate to, you'd like to jump to the front of, of stack if you'd like. So. Thank you. I'm responding to some of what's been said, and I, you know, I wanted to respond a little bit to uh, the and to say I, I'm sure you probably, you may well know all this, but there are certain connections between the, the, the ugly laws that you were alluding to, which were in Chicago for people who, uh, you know, should not appear in public because they were considered ugly or other, or they had bodies that were not conventional or typical, right? And so the ugly laws, um, but you know, one of the, the main people who led the opposition to the ugly laws in Chicago were anarchists who saw this as part of their program. Oh. And Ben Reitman, in particular, the uh, longtime lover of Emma Goldman, you know, so there's a, I'm, I'm talking off my head here, but it's in Sue Shine's book, is that it? But, um, but it's an interesting connection in terms of anarchism and aesthetics and a larger set of questions, I think that are much better addressed in anarchism than in you know, other forms of socialism, shall we say. Um, that's one thing. So I think the questions of aesthetics and the importance of that and the centrality of that, and questions about the built environment too. Like why are buildings with 8,000 stairs that you have to go up and no, no ramp and no, why is that attractive? 
Why is that how people want things? Or why do people want, or even where the, they have to put one step somewhere? Why? You know, why is this setting up hierarchies of levels a uh, basic aesthetic principle, you know, in American architecture and you know, so forth? So, I mean, there are a million questions, particularly in public and monumental works. And I think in Murray's work, also the question of what, it, uh, you know, of kind of aesthetics and technology, like, what is liberatory technology, like the technologies that I'm using and Latif is obviously using, and some of you with eyeglasses and whatever the hell else you may have going on. Um, these are, you know, these are part of you. These are built into you. They are, they should be accepted and they should be beautiful and they should be, you know, part of what it is that we understand. And I, I mean, I've also talked to permaculture groups and said to them, you know, that you have to be careful about this assumption that everything that is physical labor that has to be done with as little technology as possible, if the body can do it without electricity or without a battery or without anything, that this is not, you know, where you want to go with this, that this becomes neo-fascist or it sort of slides into the direction of eco-fascism. And, you know, the environmental movement is bad on that. It's bad on masculinism and the value structure in the same way. But so, you know, that's one set of things, and it made me think of, um, and the utopian imagination, I mean, which is so central in social ecology, you know, the question is, where are different and disabled, you know, there's a lot of work in what might be called speculative fiction, or, you know, it used to be called science fiction, but like Ursula Le Guin, and, you know, um, um, all kinds of people, Philip K. Dick even, you know, um, Octavia Butler, um, where, you know, this becomes a necessary part of the landscape or diversity or what you see, and what you see as beautiful and interesting even, yes. not just as acceptable and tolerated, you know, out of some antiseptic idea of equality. Um, and so, you know, so there's that, I think, the utopian imagination. And Kelly mentioned the first and second nature and the interface of that needs to be rethought in light of this. And it really, I mean, disability also implies a a different theory of the body, I think, than social ecology is operated out of. And finally, when I say social ecology, my experience or my thoughts about what it is really are from the ecology of freedom, probably, and not so much the later work that you all are doing, you know, out of libertarian municipalism and Murray's later work and everybody. So I respect that, but I'm talking really from the ancient point of view. And, um, um, but I think that the idea of the, the of, of also human precarity, we yeah. mentioned vulnerability, but of yes. precariousness, yeah. like yeah. the denial of precariousness. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain, uh, you know, climate justice movement is working, moving forward on trying to make a case in all kinds of ways for the precariousness of the planet and nature. But of our own bodies, each and every one of our bodies, you know, and the susceptibility and possibility of disability of all kinds. And for everyone, in a minute, you know. So, but people are in denial about that. They don't understand that this is part of the nature. So I think porousness and the entanglement in nature. And so I mean, and also I think, so, I'm gonna stop at this because it's, it's, it's too much time, but um, anti-productivism um, and also uh, healthcare in terms of what to bring into the to the, you know, in DSA or any form of movement where people are trying to figure out, you know, the relationship between support for long-term disability and different abilities and relating that as part of, you know, when people need disability support, that doesn't mean they only need medical custodial support. People need support to do all kinds of things and be active and kind of rectify the tilt of how things are lopsided. And so all of that about how we live in relation to our bodies, I think, needs to be part of Medicare for all. <laughs> Whatever we have to say. So anyway, those are things I think mean, that social ecology could take up. So we have about 20 more minutes. So I see Hugh on stack. Do you want to go next? So I, I was going to wait to ask, but it just came up, so I wanted to follow up. Uh, I, I know one of the biggest political movements going on in the US right now is Medicare for All, and I'm distantly aware from Canada that uh, the role of people with disabilities in that organizing has been complicated, and so I was wondering both what that was like from your perspectives and also how 
Uh, on the one hand, maybe some of you might feel cagey of organizing for reforms from the state in general, but like as a Canadian, it's a moral nightmare that you don't have health care, and I can see, it, for me, it seems like an immediate and obvious exception to being cagey, but pushing for reforms is just so fucking necessary. So yeah, what, what's that struggle like? I, yeah, please, go ahead. I, I'm on Medicare, um, and it's, so when I found out that I needed IV immunoglobins, my insurance company through Mount Holyoke College would not pay for it. Um, and so we, I have my pulmonologist did an appeal, did a second appeal, did a third appeal, and um, finally I found out if I switched to Medicare, they have to cover it. And this is really interesting. If you have Medicare, um, you can, your doctor can request a treatment and pretty much it's covered. Whereas with other, I mean, it's crazy. I was like, what? Uh, um, that's Canada. Yeah, so that blew my freaking mind. Um, I'm allowed to pick my own doctors. I'm allowed to, so for me, Medicare has been really, really good. People keep saying, you're, you're not 65, you, know, you get a Medicare once you are on disability. Um, now, in terms of my daughter, um, she's on my husband's insurance, and they're going to do everything they can. She cannot get on Medicare. Um, it's, it's different for children. So in a couple of years, she's 18, it will be different too. But um, it's just really, really, it's a dicey thing. I'm an anarchist. I don't believe that's, that healthcare should be commodified. but. At this moment in time, there are people who need freaking health care. So I'm absolutely, I believe in Medicare for all. Like, yeah, a thousand percent. No fucking private health. Care. Yeah. And get big pharma. And Latifah's composing a response as well. Uh, in the interim, we'll just say, yeah, I, I have not, never had access to the public health care option. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, at least I can get insurance, which with pre-existing conditions otherwise would probably not be possible, and that would be literally death sentence. So, but as it is, I spend tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket each year, almost everything I take in more actually, um, to, the, to the point of causing him perpetual debt. So in terms of the immediate, dressing immediate material needs, I see it as an important harm reduction mechanism. I don't see this as part of a radical imagination, but um, really essential. And so we'll just, um, I don't know if you want to make your, your comment, and then Latif again. Great. Um, um, I just wanted to say, um, so just to clarify, Medicare for all is not Medicare. They're very different. Um, and Medicare is privatized also in many ways. So. Yeah, that's a good conversation. I know. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to just comment, you know, um, about eugenics and the pervasiveness still in our society and globally. And I don't know if people are aware, like in Iceland, like they've pretty much eliminated people being born with Down syndrome through prenatal genetic testing. Um, and we're entering, you know, genomic medicine, and people are really, um, you know, how I think there should be a real discussion about utilizing these technologies and how they intersect with our ideas about what's normal and what is accessible and who we're valuing. Can I correct on the Medicare question or clarify to technical yeah. clarification? I think I understand this, this system as well. I think one thing that people don't actually understand is there is old-fashioned classic Medicare which there is a whole juggernaut of advertising to not let you understand that you don't have to pick any A H M O. You can have direct public Medicare. And there are a lot of doctors in New York City who will take that because they bill Medicare and Medicare just pays them. There are no inner what? 80% is covered. 80 20. Well, whatever it is, yeah. 80 20. But the point is the, the private systems which call themselves Medicare also are very different and so that depends on which system you I mean Medicare you can still take the directly federal the direct federal Medicare. I mean the supplemental plans are also private. 
No, but the supplemental yeah. things are private. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think it's important to understand the distinctions and how things get slid together, right. you know, that basically you're always being sold a bunch of private stuff that's supposed to so-called administer or supplement the public, you know, which is actually going to... So, is M4A uh, going to be 100% coverage then, or is it just extending Medicare as it exists? So there's like, I forget how many, 10 proposals for Medicare for yeah. all that all are very all different for his buy-ins. There's, you know, plans that include long-term care. It's not its own. There's a huge discussion on its own. But we also call our system Medicare. Yeah, yeah. We so saw Tower, I think, right? Yeah. And yeah. MD, and we'll circle back to the team. Oh, I just wanted to address the tension that you were mentioning. And, um, I mean, I think that um, this whole business about fighting for health care for all and leaving out long-term care is, you know, just, it's been experienced in the United States for years. Um, I mean, as, as in the fight for $15 minimum wage has, has been at the expense of people with disabilities, you know, because people's, people's uh, support workers start getting paid $15 an hour and you don't increase the amount of money that goes into supports, uh, then people with disabilities get less services. <clears throat> so I, I guess for me, I just want to point out what Latif said, or just bring circle back to that, was that because people with disabilities are not involved in a lot of these lefty movements, um, are not listened to, um, then those issues just, people don't know about those issues and they don't, they're just not being addressed. So I think, you know, Latif offered the solution there that people need to, they need to reach out to people with disabilities and not just have people there making presentations, which is good, but also just to really look at their leadership and how people are being included. I just want to say about the disability community, from a theoretical point of view, the disability community contributing to the social ecology community, namely the word mutual aid. And the ideas of mutual aid, we must not forget about them, even when we were talking about libertarian municipalism and confederalism, mutual aid and the ethics of the interpersonal relationships within a group from each according to his ability to each according to his need, that can integrally related to to all that is going on in the groups must be these ideas, that as we discuss the theoretics of these groups, those ethical ideas, mm -hmm. th those mutual aid ideas have to be there all the time. And, and, and the disability community just reminds us of the idea of mutual aid, and that's very important. And again, speaking about various hierarchy and, um, we mustn't forget that, uh, in, and Murray used to write about that in his younger days, but toward the end he didn't write about it so much, but there is also a hierarchy of mind over body. And to some extent we have to appreciate that our body is, has to be listened to on, on, on every single level, on various different levels. I just want to say about about the each according to our ability. But last night when I was sort of being dismal about the current administration and how it's different from previous, I was also speaking as a mother of a, of a disabled kid. My kid has a diagnosis that she's not going to recover from this. It's going to be a lifelong illness. And had she been diagnosed five years ago, I feel really different than I feel now. To me, it's absolutely terrifying to think of her being left to into a system right now that is really could could not be more antithetical to the principle of mutual aid than the one we have now. I mean, the, the Trump administration, a lack of an ethics of care for empathy for anything. The way that he, even when he was you know campaigning, made fun of a disabled. Um, journalist, I think, was just over the fucking top. And I think about not just my kid, but everybody's children who are going to be living with some kind of disability or chronic illness. It's absolutely terrifying. Because you, what it looks like to resist 
is really different when you can't necessarily get out of bed, where you're not all that mobile, you know, and when you can't necessarily run away from the cops. It's really, really, there's, a, again, that vulnerability piece is that as a mother, I'm like, holy shit, I've got to figure out a way to protect my kid. And the last thing I want to say is that, each according to their ability, that in movements, people need to realize that people who are dealing with disability and chronic illness are financially often struggling. Because you're not just paying, worrying about paying for today, but you're realizing that you might need a lot of care down the road. So I'm not at liberty. I, since the age of 31, I knew I had progressive illness. I wasn't at liberty to give money in the same way that other people could to various causes because I'm like trying to shore up you know, it can be that I would not have an income at a certain point. And my daughter probably will never have an income. And so just to be aware of that, it's not just how much you have right now if you have a disability, but, but you're, you're, you're in a financially weird kind of situation that people aren't always totally aware of. Yes, I agree that the imagination needs to be expanded because I think dominant culture has really tried to impose the possibilities of identity, especially around disability. What I mean is there is a pervasive assumption that the able body was given and not questions. So I agree with the first set of comments that our imagination needs to be expanded, especially around different types of bodies existing in the community. Um, go ahead. Grace, did I see you on step two or no? Did I make that up? Uh, no, I'm on step two. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, no. Okay, so we'll take one, two, and then Bobby. Is that okay? Good. Well, I, um... My, my comment really is that I wanted to, to introduce was the one about around the relationship of disability and non-human animals because I think that that's, um, that the idea that all of animal agriculture is, is the, the model of capitalist industrial exploitive animal factories is, um, you know, it, it's not correct in terms of the, you know, the whole history, not to mention the, the possibilities and the alternatives that require uh, an ecological system of food production and, um, and the, you know, this is what, one of the things that uh, I think a lot, probably the, all of our culture, and all of our society, including the left and the environmental movement, has a profound fear and denial of the fact of death as part of life. It isn't that, you know, that we try to avoid any, any you know, and anything that involves death is an inherently oppressive and violent, and it isn't. Um, and so I, I just kind of want to bring in that idea that, um, you know, an ecological understanding, particularly of food, is that all beings, all beings, whether they're sentient, unsentient, and we can talk about the fact that in most um, indigenous cos cosmologies, all of, uh, all of the environment is, has sentience. Plants, rocks, trees, etc. So aside from that, the idea that all living organisms die and all living organisms then become food for other living organisms, and um, that is really something that, that I, I find that there's a lot of desire to avoid even thinking about. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Just so we have Vera and Bobby, 
reminder it's a progressive stack, so if I haven't gotten to you, that's part of the reason why. Um, just in terms of we have about five minutes left in the session. So Cora, maybe we'll give you last word after that. Does that sound good? Sure. <laughs> that's, that's a great idea. <laughs> so I wanted to just bring up um, the relationship between imagination and hierarchy. And because what I have observed, and I know very little about disability related issues, but at universities now we have the beginning of the emergence of something that we call disability studies. And what I see is that it's, um, it's pretending to have the imagination, yet most universities emphasize that disability studies has a particular hierarchy related to how research will inform the healthcare industry. And I think it's so interesting to sort of reimagine um, the type of disabilities we can have, uh, the type of responses we should pursue, mm -hmm. and the kinds of allies and structures and conversations we should build around um, preventing these kinds of new hierarchies to emerge that, make, that snuff out our imagination of how we can create a new way of living together. Because what I see is that universities are increasingly dependent on financial support, uh, health um, systems, uh, lean on researchers, and then there's pressure to identify which type of disability by at the same time, I think it's also related uh, to care for the elders, I think falls into that as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of how we can establish a system, in essence is the question, that serves the capitalist structure mm -hmm. most. And I think that is something that is a very important conversation to have. Who has a disability? What is a disability? imagine ways of integrating people with a broad range of disabilities into uh, creating a world around us that allows inclusion, uh, collaboration, exchange of ideas, and challenging this new structure because I think, I think I'm pretty sure it's coming towards us. Oh, no. <laughs> I just want to say, first of all, California Institute of Integral Studies is one of my favorite institutions because at San Francisco State, I was there 30 years, a lot of my co-workers and my students went on to get their higher degrees there. But even what, what, I wanted to allude to, what you talked about was like the disability rights movement, being a more middle class and stuff, and the first thing that came to mind was the Center for Independent Living, which is in Berkeley, which did a lot of work behind getting access, like getting the curbs fixed for wheelchairs and stuff. But I hadn't thought of the term about they left out people of color and poorer people. And that's, an, I think, you know, uh, it's just refreshing me on that struggle and what needs to be done around that area. But um, I just got to say it, uh, keep up the work. <laughs> Thank you. I, I yeah, wanted to highlight something also Latif said about how um, thinking about the politics of care means that we are changed by becoming an accessible political community and how we think about what, it, what participation is and how we can make that precondition possible so that, of course, disabled people can participate and also caregivers can participate and that we have to do whatever it takes to um, end conflicts between, uh, you know, meeting the needs of caregivers and the disabled, certainly. <laughs> and, and that obviously, in, in certainly in the United States, the politics of caregiving, I mean, th these are overwhelmingly low-wage immigrant women, um, and care in general is what, and the demands of caregiving for unpaid caregivers obviously inhibits people from participating in our political work. So this is a liberatory project, and I love the idea that we are changed, both in our imagination and, um, and in our hearts, basically, when we expand our, our, uh, our ability to think about what it, what it means to do politics, so. Uh, are we still looking our up now? Um, we're right about time. Our next thing is lunch, and we have free time, so we're now back to 4.15, so if we want to go a little over.
Okay, so I, I know Ross put a comment and okay. Maybe we can just announce that the yes. folks are doing lunch uh, yes. duty should probably have. Great. Do we, is that, can someone see on the list? People have forgotten. Ashley and Mike. Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, I appreciate the comment um, that was made about uh, the action that anarchists took in Chicago against the ugly laws. Uh, I did want to push back a bit uh, against the implication towards the end that this was uh, Exclusive. This this was unique to anarchists. I think that uh, Marxists have contributed a lot to uh, protesting against. Uh, in fact, the social model that was mentioned uh, by Kelly um, came out of a, a British group, uh, UPIAS, um, and uh, a theorist, uh, Michael Oliver, who popularized it um, within a sort of Marxian framework. Um, uh, obviously, there were have been uh, very prominent Marxists uh, historically. Uh, Jose Mariátegui, the Peruvian theorist, was wheelbar wheelchair bound uh, most of his life. Uh, Helen Keller was a was an outspoken supporter of the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, but I think that a comment Latif made in his presentation about. Um, the role of the, the historical role of the rise of capitalism, and the way that ability, disability, is mediated by the social division of labor, that really structures the way that access to, you know, different uh, benefits within society uh, takes place. And I think that that, if there is one contribution that a sort of Marxian perspective can bring to this, I mean, beyond just social ecology. And disability, it is this so, sort of attention to the social totality as mediated by the division of labor in society. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that in, in uh, Montreal, there's a few uh, social solidarity economy projects uh, in the health domain, uh, like co-ops of uh, doctors, you know, and uh, health health services can also organize as co-ops and, uh, you know, non-capitalist uh, collective uh, uh, solidarity organizations, so just bring that out there. Since they're still setting up lunch, just people who yeah, haven't spoken this discussion yet, so I think Brooke, Mason, Laura, can we take that? Yeah, I'm really appreciative for all of you on the panel, and I'm just curious, Latif, you also have in your bio um, that you do research around sexuality, and I'm just always, you know, I'm always struck when we're talking about ability and disability, how low the bar is. You know, I mean, I think we're usually talking about getting people in the door, saving them from getting beaten up by police and allowing them to go to the bathroom. I mean, that's a very low bar as anarchists for our society to be looking at. And I'm struck, I mean, I, my godchild has cerebral palsy, and I was looking, you know, I was in discussion with her and looking up different resources around sexuality, which there are people that actually support sexual encounters between people who have ability issues around sexuality. And I just is like, to me that is like the pinnacle of like beautiful mutual aid. That's not simply about getting people in the door and allowing them to go to the bathroom. And I'm just wondering, you know, I'm just curious about your work around pleasure and around all the other aspects that I think people who are take for granted that it that it you know this isn't a revolution if we can't dance kind of ethic, which I think doesn't often get extended to people with ability needs, and doesn't certainly doesn't get extended in, into the realm of mutual aid except for in really rare circumstances. So I'm curious whether your research enters into that realm. Uh, well, the team's composing. Um, I've just been thinking a lot about what Lucky said about collective access as a kind of value. Um, so my, my main engagement with um, disability rights is as it relates to public transit, which is what I mostly work on. And one of the, uh, we, we work closely with a number of disability rights organizations and some of our key partners. And one of the things that they like 
emphasized and begun to put into that messaging a lot is that one, being able-bodied is almost in all circumstances a temporary um, state um, and eventually most people lose the ability to drive at some point in their lives. Um, and secondly, if that we can develop um, a commons of collective access, something in which the society's luxury is placed in um, the public sphere rather than, um, than private, uh, that's simultaneously something that <laughs> ensures um, that all people have, have physical freedom um, and also the kind of creating conditions for a broader social well-being um, that kind of gets um, forgotten about because it's not just it's not just what is good for disabled people. It's by bringing their um, interests into shaping what the built environment and pub sphere is like that um, leads to um, a more um, communal um, space for us all to um, to have a better life. Yeah, so um, first I wanted to respond to what you were saying about um, the connection between factory farming and ableism. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because you were looking at it uh, from the perspective of how um, industrial farming intentionally disables uh, non-human animals, which is definitely very true. Um, but the flip side to that is that the workers are involved in work that is extremely dangerous, uh, where they very often develop physical and also mental uh, disabilities through it, that they can go through, um, you know, I mean, obviously very physical dangerous work, but also the psychological trauma of killing for a living. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and more broadly, just this idea of ableism not just being what is done to disabled people, but also things that cause disabilities. Um, you know, violence, systemic violence, like factory farming, also war, and, you know, all different forms of oppression, police brutality, all of these things cause disability, in addition to being harder on people with disabilities. So. Um, that was something that I wanted to bring up. And I also wanted to talk about uh, Latif's point about, um, you know, when you brought up uh, the challenges of people with disabilities in communalist settings. Um, that is something that I've actually thought about a lot. Um, first of all, in terms of the challenges that might arise from that, especially for people with psychological disabilities, um, where it might be hard for them to be in a setting where so much is dependent on getting along with the people that you're living with and where your you know, entire stability in some ways is dependent upon that. And so you know, I was wondering if uh, any of the panelists could speak to how that, that may be dealt with to make sure that you know, in such a decentralized setting, people with disabilities would be secure, that it wouldn't be dependent on that. Um, and also, on the other hand, um, and the woman over here kind of brought this up, but I just want to elaborate on it, also the idea of disability uh, enhancing the social ecology of the communities. And, um, you know, specifically, like, I think that this idea of neurodiversity um, is really inspiring, this idea that we're not all meant to have the same types of brains, that, um, you know, these are gifts that people with different types of brains can bring. And also, I think we should also look about look at physiodiversity and how physiodiversity, different types of bodies, different types of abilities can contribute to the ecology of a community and enhance it. Um, I, Going back to uh, Latifa's speech uh, about um, inclusiveness um, of everybody, um, there are two things that came in mind. Uh, one, that there are some things that have happened uh, that are where people have already researched quite deeply that can be 
um, quite inspiring. Actually, in, in the early 90s, there was a document that came out of the World Health Organization that already had guidelines for inclusiveness, um, widespread inclusiveness, not only from an access and health point of view, but also from a participation in the social life and inclusive life in, in total social life. Uh, unfortunately, um, as probably most people <laughs> Uh, can understand um, here in the US it was never really fully embraced versus it was embraced in Europe in Canada and other countries um, because of the health insurance monopoly and, 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 and the capitalist oriented society um, and so there are some ideas that already have been brought um, to place and another idea that actually stemmed from some architects um, in the US is the concept of universal design mm -hmm. that I think is really, really interesting because it really talks about preemptively uh, creating and designing a society that includes everybody and any kind of disability, mm -hmm. even temporary disability includes, you know, a woman who is pregnant, her situation is quite different. Or, you know, people aging. So your design, it started with the architectural design of buildings, but it's really um, taken a whole other um, direction um, out in education, in learning, in um, every aspect of the society. And it's a really, really interesting uh, concept that could be applied also to ecology and, uh, and could be very interesting to be explored by the social ecologist movement, I think, and embraced. That's it. So, yeah, while Latifah's um, finishing composing his response, and I think that will we'll, we'll can end with him, but Topper wanted to make well, more just, the interim. I'm glad the way that conversation is kind of broadening a little bit. Um, um, obviously, I'm not from the social ecology world here. Um, but, um, not obviously, but I'll just say I'm not. Uh, I mean, it just, what I think of, you know, I think of disability justice and when I hear what Latif is talking about, you know, it's not just about taking care of each other and making sure people that are sick get what they need. You know, it's, you know, it's about neurodiversity. It's about the fact, it's about equal opportunity. It's about um, making sure people get accommodation. You know, like it's, it's broad, it's like, you know, the ableism, you know, has such an impact on our world that the world is designed with just a certain people in mind, with people with a certain amount of, of abilities to walk and see and, and move and think. And, and so that when we get, when we bust away ableism, like the whole is going to be much better, not just because everybody will be taken care of, but because it'll be a richer experience for everyone. So, I mean, the, you know, just want to kind of emphasize that. When I think of disability justice, that's kind of more what I'm thinking about, more the equal opportunity and that people without disabilities are going to be a whole hell of a lot better off if they start looking at the richness and talents and points of view of people with disabilities because it's going to, because it's going to broaden their view and give them newer and fresher ideas. Okay, so we'll uh, take what's the last comment. Yeah. Uh, A minor correction, I create a right around sexuality more than I do research. But I can tell you from my personal experience in the research I did around this topic, I can tell you it is still a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. Historical America had a big eugenics movement that saw the sexuality of people with disabilities as threatening. I think this has a lingering effect where there is a preconceived notion that people with significant disabilities are sexual so that affects people with disabilities expressing their sexuality. 
I think it also has to do with the hierarchy of bodies that is also a part of the culture and affects possibility attraction. Great, thanks for the engagement.